Welcome to What's Going On, the weekly podcast and video cast of First United Methodist Church in Yankton, South Dakota. Hi, and welcome to this week's episode of What's Going On. I'm Pastor Katie, and I'm here this week for the episode that you have been waiting for. Uh, we're going to be uh, going over annual conference 2022 of the Dakotas Conference, and I have with me today the three lay delegates who came from First United Methodist Church here in Yankton, South Dakota. So sitting right next to me is Craig Sherman. You know Craig from the church, and he's on staff with the church, and he's also, uh, I would say, jack of all trades here. You do a little bit of everything, and so uh, thank you, Craig, for being here. Next to him, we have our conference lay delegate that is our liaison to the leadership team, and that's Bob Thuey. Tui. What is it? Well, my father always said Tui, but nobody wants to say Tui because there's a TH in it. So they say Tui. And so I would answer to either. What would you prefer? Tui. Tui. <laughs> because that's what 90% of the people use around me. Now. All right. <laughs> We're going to keep that in so everyone knows. You can call him either, but let's go with Tui. I think that the, your family in Milbank went by Tui. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and most people do. But it, when I was playing basketball, if I ever scored any points, I also would say two for two. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get. I mean, my last name's Ricky, and it, and uh, people can't spell it because they think there should be an I E, or they say Ricka, which I think is probably closer to the German. But. <laughs> and on the end, we have Dan Johnson. Dan is our. Uh, lay leader for our, our congregation and he also sits on the leadership team as the lay leader uh and dan took over the uh final lay delegate spot when when tiffany was unable to go and he was approved by our leadership team they have the ability to do that in lieu of a charge conference um, and so dan thanks for stepping in and uh and going to annual conference this year it was a big commitment we all had to drive to bismarck um and so uh, beautiful time, beautiful weather we had up there. Uh, it's definitely, it was nicer this year than in years past when it felt like we were in the middle of the desert. Um, but uh, what we're going to do is kind of go over some of what happened at annual conference. You're also going to be receiving in the newsletter for July um, the summary that the conference has put out about what happened at annual conference. So we're going to use that as our baseline and then sort of make some ex explanations and, and comments here and there and, and some of our own insights. Uh, because there are four of us, uh, we all kind of did some different things and had some uh, different impacts. And we have Dan, who this was his first time at annual conference as a delegate. And so it's always fun to kind of hear a, a fresh perspective on the things that are happening, both Bob and Craig. How, do you know how many annual conferences you've been to? I did not prep them for About any of these 14, questions. Fourteen. Somewhere around. Yeah, several. I would say probably eight. You know, half a dozen, eight maybe. Okay. I don't know. Well, I think Craig, you've been to more than I've been to because I know this is my eighth year in ministry, and I've only I think I went to one or two before that. So, um, I think you are the expert in the room. <laughs> and so. One of the things that was a little different this year at annual conference is annual conference is the gathering of all of the churches in North and South Dakota. So ours is the Dakotas Conference. Um, so that includes the clergy of the Dakotas Conference as well as lay delegates. Annual conference has to have an equal number of clergy and lay delegates. Um, and so uh, that, is, that is partially determined of how many people are there. Uh, and then it's presided over by our bishop. Well, this year was a bit interesting in that our current bishop we share with the Iowa Conference, and that's Bishop Lori Holler. But a few months ago, a couple months ago, uh, Bishop Lori Holler ended up on medical leave. She was out running and fell and had a massive concussion. Uh, and so she's been out of medical leave. And while she's been out, a retired Bishop Deborah Kesey has stepped in to cover the two conferences. That name might be familiar to you. Bishop Kesey was the Bishop of the Dakotas Conference before her retirement. She was the Bishop prior to Bishop O. 
Uh, Bishop O was also in attendance at our annual conference. He and Bishop Kesey uh, shared the duties of a bishop and the duties of presiding over the conference. Um, they kind of split those duties um, between them. And so it was kind of a neat thing in that we had uh, interim bishops, but they were two bishops that have both served our conference in the past. And so have a lot of knowledge, a lot of relationship built there, know who we are, know what we're about. Um, and so that was that was kind of an interesting feature, I think, of this year's conference. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit because this is a question that's come up a lot in the local church here about lay delegates. Um, so lay delegates are elected from the local charge. This is Yankton's charge, uh, but they don't necessarily just represent this church. They are lay members annual conference. As I mentioned before, uh, we have to have an equal number of clergy and lay people to make decisions in the church. The clergy can't kind of overpower the lay people and vice versa. We, we sort of are democratic that way. Um, and we vote on almost everything. Um, and we have a lot of clergy that don't serve churches. We have clergy that serve in extension ministries. We have um, retired clergy, things like that. And so we have to have uh, lay people that kind of balance that out. So for every clergy serving a charge, there's a lay person that the charge also gets to send. And so one of these would kind of balance me out. I'm the clergy from Yankton, so Yankton gets to send uh, a lay delegate one for one. As you notice, we have three. I don't, I'm not worth three lay delegates. So why do we have three? Well, the other two are there to balance out clergy that are serving in other ways. So serving in extension ministries that are not in a local church context. Uh, like we have clergy that are serving in seminaries. We have clergy that are serving on global boards. We have um, you know, in a variety of ways. And so the other two, because we're a larger church, um, when we have more of the lay population in the conference, then two more of the lay members come from our church for that reason. I bring that up because one of the uh, legislation pieces that we voted on actually had to do with how that got figured out. And so I just wanted to kind of start us off that the three of them don't go to conference to represent uh, the interests of Yankton Church. They are there as non-clergy voices of the United Methodist Church in the Dakotas. Because we are a larger church, we get to send more, but that's by virtue of there's more Dakotas United Methodists attending Yankton than attending a church like uh, Vermilion, let's say. Uh, so I hope, does that make sense? Does that make sense to the three of you? Did you know that about yourselves? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> We're all learning here. Um, so let's maybe just start off with uh, what were some impressions that you got this year at annual conference? What were some of the things that you were excited about looking forward to going in um, before we kind of dive into our specific legislation? Or what were you anxious about or thinking about as you drove, drove up? <laughs> Since I hadn't ever been to an annual conference, I'll, I'll start. Um, the first really neat thing about going to annual conference was that I got to spend about seven hours with Craig Sherman, who <laughs> I've known Craig for years and years. And, you know, we exchange a few sentences back and forth when we see each other, but it was really a, a joy and a blessing to be able to get to know Craig better. and. I'll tell you, if you want to, if you have any questions about anything going on in our conference, as far as different churches and, and pastors and stuff, Craig seems to know everything about it. He's got an amazing amount of institutional knowledge about our conference and what goes on, and he's an amazing resource um, if, if anybody ever has any questions. So that was really fun, and we had a, we had a good time driving up, and and driving back. Um, I guess I'd always heard about annual conference and really didn't have any idea what to expect. I, when I, uh, when they were looking for somebody to go, I initially thought, well, God, there's got to be somebody else better that could go. 
But um, then I thought, well, there's not really a huge reason I can't. Um, my trepidation about going was I, it, I just was afraid I wouldn't know anybody, that I wouldn't know what was going on. But the format of it is really welcoming. Um, there's a lot of interesting things to see uh, both in terms of just the way the governance of the whole uh, conference uh, is run. Um, there were, this year they had these breakout sessions that were like TED Talks uh, that were some really good topics. I um, attended several. One was on welcoming your neighbors that had a lot to do with what churches are doing to support uh, immigrant families um, from all over the world. Um, and the latest batch is that there's probably going to be some Ukrainian uh, families that might come into the mix. So it was interesting to, to hear what uh, powerful project that can be for a congregation should they be so inclined to, to help a, a family that's you know, come from the other side of the earth. Mm. Um, I thought um, that I wouldn't know anybody, but it's amazing how many people I ran into that I have, you know, known from being a member of this church all the way back to my childhood. I, I ran into uh, Edwin Coates, who was the a Methodist minister who was the son of my Sunday school teacher in Edgemont, South Dakota. And it was, and his family had homesteaded right next to where my grandparents homesteaded. So it was, it was blew me away that there were so many connections um, at this, this gathering that I thought was going to be big and anonymous and I wouldn't know anybody. And it was anything but that. I, you know, I got to see Howard Granager and Rebecca, his daughter's a big mover and shaker mm -hmm. in the conference. Uh, got to see Sarah Stoddard, now McManus. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's a rising star in our conference. She, you know, contributed a lot. Uh, she was able to sway opinions because she's a good communicator. But having known Sarah from, you know, from years ago, it was neat to see how how well she's doing. And she said the only thing she remembered from her fifth grade, her fifth grade uh, Bible or Sunday school class that I was teaching at that time was a video we made about, I think it was the birth of Jesus and how it was medically too accurate. And she said it was the probably the only sex education thing she had growing up. It was very embarrassing. And I thought I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but, but she remembered it. That she had a good memory of it. Well, it didn't scare her off from the church at all. So. No, no, no. no um, they did shout out one thing that I, I wanted to highlight. There was a, they kind of had a little advertisement for a website that is really a good uh, evangelism tool that's called, it's just simple, it's just, it's called hegetsus.com, uh, all lowercase, so hegetsus.com, and it's a really well-produced little introduction about Jesus Christ. It has a lot of links that people could click on, but um, I just wanted to, you know, say I went to the website and looked at it, it's really well done, it's um, fun to look at, and it's um let's see so that was it it was good i would if, if somebody gets the opportunity to go someday it was i'm really glad i went and i feel like i have a much greater understanding of the hierarchy of the methodist church and some of the challenges that everybody's facing as well as the triumphs that we continue to make as a church That was very well said, I would. <laughs> so how about the two of you who've been to some annual conferences before? How did this one sort of compare to ones in the past and in, in tone and um, in your experience? I, I would speak first about the tone of the conference I thought was probably more conciliatory than I really expected because of the division and so forth is taking place in some congregations over some of the issues that the church is facing nowadays. And, and it was, it was very, uh, 
very welcoming and accepting of different points of view and different attitudes and different presentations. It, it's just so open and welcoming. It just surprised me because the last time we met together as a group, there were some pretty strong words exchanged between people. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, this, was, this was different. This was very, very well organized and well done. And, and uh, so in that regard, I think the tone was just remarkable, mm -hmm. just remarkable how how cordial and, and so forth people were towards one another, no matter what their differences were. Mm -hmm. They were very accepting and open and cordial with one another. And I was kind of concerned about that, I guess, as to what was going to happen this year in regard to, you know, some churches leaving the, the conference and that sort of thing and how that was going to work and how they were going to settle all the things in regard to property and clergy and all those things. Those are complicated issues, but mm -hmm. I think it went quite smoothly. <clears throat> Uh, going up there, I was I was uh, looking forward to it because there are so many people in the conference over the years that I have met, and I was looking forward to meeting them and seeing them again. And uh, one of the things that really surprised me, the table right next to me was Ron Olson, and he was my mentor at the Walk to Emmaus uh, spiritual retreat that I went to. And he, he was sitting right next to me. I didn't realize that until we went up for communion during one of the services. And he was right behind me. <laughs> so that was really, really uh, a good thing. It really made me feel good to see him again. Mm. We, were, we were good friends. And then another man from the from the Walk to Emmaus thing who's kind of one of the organizers. He's from Clint Wood uh, from, uh, from Winter. He... Uh, I got to talk to him during some of the breaks and stuff. So that was so good to, to see those guys again, you know, mm -hmm. make that connection. So uh, other than that, I, uh, like Dan was talking about, I went to some of the uh, uh, workshops and that sort of thing. And there's one in particular that Ben Engelbretson was talking, it was called the, the, the Tree of Discipleship. I, and it was more, it was, I would call it like what they call discipleship, I'd call evangelism, but it was really good. I got a lot out of that and, uh, and uh, got some ideas about that that I could share with you, but we'll, we'll, we can come back to that if we can't want to. But uh, yeah, it, uh, it was informative, it was interesting, it was friendly, it was well organized and uh, we didn't waste any time. And I think the, the new electronic devices that we used to vote with, that was amazing. It used to be that we had to sit there for forever, 10, 15 <laughs> minutes or an hour before they got all the ballots counted on every vote that we took. And sometimes we wouldn't find out what, how the vote turned out until the next session. And, yeah. and uh, no, we found out almost instantly what the results of our votes were. And uh, most of the votes that we took were overwhelmingly in favor of whatever proposals were being made so there was very little yeah. division there at all. yeah we didn't have any votes that were really close yeah. this time and yeah i would say that if they've made one one change that made the greatest improvement in any conference this year it was the electronic voting by far um dan you did not have to go through the, <laughs> the paper ballot uh, and, yeah. and i would only <laughs> add one more thing and I'll, I'll close with that but if you want to know what went on at the conference, you want to hear some of the sermons or some of the presentations, some of the workshops, all that is available if you go to First United or the United Methodist Dakotas Conference website. Yeah. So that's dakotasumc.org. Right, dakotasumc.org. And they have links there to almost everything that went on at mm -hmm. the conference. And it was, yeah. Yeah, Thursday evening, we had a get together in one of the parks there. And uh, there was food and games for the kids and games for the adults. And they had a beanbag toss there. And I didn't want to take part in that, but these two guys talked me into it. <laughs> and I went and looked at the photos just the other day, the photos that they took at that event. Here's Craig and I, front and center, throwing beanbags. 
But Dan wasn't in the picture. Dan, oh, I, I looked it through all the photos I see. Dan wasn't in any of the pictures. You were in the in some of the pictures of the conference because you were serving communion. You know that you were front and center there. But I it was. I thought, oh, boy, I sure looked sloppy when I was at that picnic. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting about like you go and you make connections with people at conference. The conference photographer has been there since 2015. Um, and so while you guys were playing beanbags, I was actually visiting with her because she is from Mitchell and I used to live in Mitchell and, and we were uh, connecting that way. Um, but that was someone this year that I got to know a little bit more because I've seen her around every year at conference. And I'm like, you know, I, I feel like I know you, but I didn't know her very well yet. And so that was a fun connection for me this year. Craig, what about you? Well, like I said, I've been... From like 96 to 2006, I was the delegate here. I started out as a lay equalization delegate and then became one of our actual delegates that we had two of them back then because we had two pastors and stuff. And so the biggest thing that I've noticed from those 10 years until the last four or five years I've been going um, is there's a lot, most things are decided ahead, not ahead of time, but the conference committees do so much a great job, like with the budget and stuff, you know, we, only if something's pulled off that needs to be discussed more is discussed. Otherwise, everything's pretty well done. You know, we have the pre-conference sessions where they explain everything to us, what we're going to be voting on and stuff. So that's helpful. So, you know, the, that has changed over the years. The voting, yeah, because I know especially now we didn't have to vote for delegates this year, but you know, sometimes that takes five or six ballots before they get it down. Whereas with electronic, it'd be so much, and it was, worked really well. Um, and of course, I've connect with people from Gal that was a delegate from Presho Parish out there that I probably haven't seen in 40 years, maybe 30 some years. <laughs> um, was from the church out there, so she's filling me on who's still out in Presho where I used to live when I taught for eight years out there and stuff. And then I see delegates from other churches, Sioux Falls Wesley. I guess she's not at Wesley anymore. She's at Asbury now. But there were other a couple other delegates that I knew when I sang in the choir at Wesley between my one job and going to grad school before I came to Yankton then. So, I mean, it, it's always good to see people that you know. And I was very appreciative of the two presiding bishops because they pretty much set the tone and asked us to be, you know, considerate of each other. And, and so as Bob said, he was, you know, and, and that's, I was kind of, worried about how things were going to go too with the division that's coming in the conference and stuff but i think it was handled with a lot of grace is the way i would say it people were respectful of each other i mean there were a couple times it got a little tense but it never got overboard mm -hmm. and you know in the sessions i went to i mean they've alluded to some of them you know i went to the one on called living big <coughs> Gal from Sioux Falls that talked about um, boundaries, integrity, and generosity, and it had to do with, you know, she was a situation and you know, how to keep yourself from getting into situations that are not good. And um, I went to the one on the welcoming our neighbors, that was really good. And the one I want, thing I want was kind of interesting or exciting to me is that one of our new conference co lay leaders is a gentleman named Carl Rokeman, and he's from the Dickinson United Methodist Church leadership team. Well, for those of you that aren't aware of it, last year, Prairie Winds United Methodist Church, which is in Dickinson, was the church that disaffiliated or left the conference. And so the remnants of those United Methodists from that church that wanted to stay with our connectional denomination are working towards starting up a new congregation or a new church. Mm -hmm. And so I thought it was really exciting that he stepped forward. And he's going to be one of our co-lay leaders. So, yeah, I find that a really cool piece of, you know, that was a hard thing last year. From last year going into this year, that thing kind of informed some of our our anxiety and hesitation of um, when Dickinson disaffiliated. And they they it's a church that was a UMC church that now aligns with. Uh, a denomination, I think, based out of Oklahoma, uh, not something I'm familiar with. 
uh, there's a lot of pain that comes in that because as you've heard, like this is a small conference where you, you might go in thinking you don't know people, but you end up knowing people. And, uh, you know, we all know each other and connected to each other. Our ministries are connected to each other. And so those things are painful and there's grief there. Um, but one of the things that we saw kind of hope coming out of that is, you know, so Dickinson left, but not everybody left. And the people that wanted to stay are, are I think probably more committed than ever to to being a witness for Jesus uh, in their community as as United Methodists. One of the things I heard all of them talk about really is that connection, and that's I think what's so special about our church and about our conference times. Are every United Methodist church is connected to one another, and and we share um, experience, and we share ministry, and we share um, both the things that encourage one another and our, our victories and also we share our hardships and um that's i think one of the benefits of when we gather together is we are reminded that um, we're part of something larger so i just want to go through um <coughs> some of the things that we voted on uh, because that's part of the business of the annual conference is um we are there to make decisions and so uh if you are kind of unaware we are a very uh, we are structured as a hierarchy in the United Methodist Church, and so we have at the local level the ch the local church, which um, the pastor kind of presides over the local church, and there, and we have our leadership team here, and they can make decisions about our local budget. They can make decisions about some policies within our local church, um, but they are ever guided by decisions that are made higher up. The next level up is the annual conference. And so there are certain things that we can make decisions and vote on at the annual conference level that then affects every church within that annual conference. But it can never vote on things that would go against what is decided on at the general conference level, which is all United Methodist churches everywhere and so i just want you to kind of keep in mind that annual conference is sort of like middle management road right like <laughs> um it, it is only there's only certain things that it has real um authority over in what we can vote on and so keep that in mind that some of the things that you might think that we're able to do at annual conference level um we can't we can't change the book of discipline at the annual conference level that's our our guidebook our rule book uh for the united methodist church <clears throat> but there are certain things that we can do. One of the things that we talked about was the budget. Um, just as we have a budget for our local church, our annual conference also has to approve a budget every year. Um, there was only one item that was lifted out of the budget this year uh, for discussion, and that was, uh, and I just want to bring it up because I think it's kind of things that people don't don't pay attention to or think about. So we have district superintendents. Ours is Rebecca Trevs. They are um, they are kind of the level in between the bishop and the pastors, but they overlook the churches in their district. Um, and our district superintendents are paid uh, at the conference level. So when we pay our apportionments, part of our apportionments go to their salaries, and they do a lot of work. Um, and they also get uh, a parsonage or a housing allowance, just like a pastor does, um, as part of that salary, as part of that compensation. Uh, we, one of our district superintendents is married to a pastor in our conference, and she lives in the parsonage provided by uh, the church that he serves. Um, and so the conference cut way down on what they were paying her for housing allowance, which seems like, well, that's great. Everyone, like, we just saved a few bucks there, no big deal. Well, part of the problem is, is her pension is based on that, uh, as, as the housing as part of her um, compensation. And when they cut that way down, then they also cut down on the pension contributions, which I don't know if you know this, but if pastors are given parsonages, we are not building equity um, for for the future. And so, um, part of that money is is there to help us when we retire, either buy a house, maybe for the first time, or you know, to be able to have have enough to live on moving forward. Um, and so, it was kind of a justice issue in that that she was really getting compensated much less than the other DSs. Uh, just by virtue of what her husband did. Uh, and so we did vote to rectify that and bring up her um, compensation to be equal with the other DSs. So that was the one change made to the budget as proposed. Um, our budget is less than it was 
for 2022, uh, a 7.2 percent decrease. Um, also, I believe, did we approve that our apportionment percentage is going down again for 2023? I think we're yeah. down. Are we down? Are we down? Because it used to be 16%, and then we went to 15% this year, 14, and then 14. next year it'll be 14%. Um, and so what that means is that the local church, whatever we take in for our general operating budget, so that's not our memorials, that's not if you give, you know, um, to a building project or something, it's just our regular offering that comes in, our apportionment, our, our percentage of that. And so it started at 16%, and uh, we've been trying to move down every year. Our goal is to get to a true tie, the true 10%. That money, again, part of that goes to uh, to our conference staffing and the work that they're doing, but it goes also to the work that the general conference is doing. All of our shared ministry together comes out of the, those apportionment dollars, but they also go to help smaller churches that maybe can't pay fully for a pastor to come. Uh, there's there's uh, grants and things that help those churches to be able to do that. So that's one of the ways that that we work together to make sure ministry is happening everywhere in our conference. Um, do you have any other things out of the budget discussion that you want to lift up? I think um, with the Dickinson um, Curry Winds experience, one of the things that they've they've learned from that is, and that probably was one of the main themes of the conference is that they're really preparing for this difficult choice that different churches are going to have to make, and it's they were I think taken a little bit unawares the first time through, but there's been a lot of effort to make transitions as organized as possible which includes realizing that in churches that do decide to go with the, the global methodist church the ones that are, aren't so welcoming to the lgbtq community that there's going to be methodists like there was in dickinson that are kind of left as a much smaller congregation and they're looking ahead to make sure there's going to be money to support those remnant churches as far as pastoral support um, and other things that will probably require just a little bit more money to keep things operating. So I, I was just really impressed at how much, uh, how well organized they are as far as trying to lay out a much more uh, less chaotic way of dis disaffiliating should that be the choice of the church um, so it was it was really good to see that um, they, they're thinking this through a way ahead of time and i think it gave me hope that we know this is going to be a difficult thing as far as our our methodist faith and what what goes going forward how welcoming we want to be as individual churches but um i have hope that it you know, the whole system is not going to come apart. It, it's going to be organized and and there's going to be still some commonalities. You know, if a church does split, th there's going to be ways in which we can use the church camps together. Mm -hmm. And there's still going to be some, some connection that maybe that'll be the path in the future that we come back together because... I think there's a lot of parallels between what's going on and, and you know the way slavery used to tear apart the Methodist Church, and nobody would argue that we're going to go back to slavery. And I kind of think that someday everything will come back together. We'll probably be, I think, everybody will be more welcoming once it becomes obvious that's probably the way to go. <laughs> so. I mean, we do have a history in the Methodist Church of splitting and coming back together, um, and and you can see that throughout our history of using the example of around the Civil War, we had the church split in the North and South, and then they did come back together. And and so, um, you know, this is not the first time that we've we've gone through this. Uh, first time with this kind of being the impetus for it, but uh, it's not something that we as a denomination are are completely foreign to. 
Um, I would say in regards to connecting that back to the budget, one of the things with the budget being less than it was is, is taking into account that uh, there are some churches within the conference that probably will be ready to disaffiliate um, either by the end of this year or early next year. There are churches that have been kind of on that path for a while and are in that process. And so they did keep that in mind as they were setting the budget, knowing that when churches disaffiliate, um, but we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but once they leave, they're no longer paying their apportionments, which means you know that allotted money that that the conference would use for funding would no longer be there. So one of the kind of concerns is if we have enough churches leaving, do we have the funding to have all that we have at the conference level? The conference has done a really good job of sort of knowing and anticipating. You know, these are the churches that that. Um, that are most likely going to disaffiliate who have expressed interest in that in the past and 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 then maybe even have begun that process um so is it appropriate to share which churches it seems like that's going to be that are pretty or is it i think early? it's i think at this point it's still it would still be speculation okay. um but one of the things that i did hear talk about is that there might be a special called annual conference for the purpose of disaffiliating churches, and that would be like what the agenda of that conference would be um, to kind of split it from our annual yearly general our annual conference. Um, but there's there's been nothing put on the schedule for that. Um, but at this point, you know, I think because we are so close, because we are so small. Uh, and have sort of a family feel like we kind of know we have some ideas but that doesn't necessarily mean I you know I've thought more than once that I thought I knew what was going to happen uh, in the church and then you know I'm way wrong <laughs> so like uh, I would say at this point um, we're, I don't know yet we'll we'll find out we'll find out um, let's move on to some of the legislation that we voted on uh, so we talked about the budget the second one is a resolution that calls for the establishing of a new standing committee created by the common table to navigate inter Methodist relations. So this actually goes to what Dan was just talking about, about um, when so the global Methodist Church is a new Methodist denomination that was recently established, um, but it hasn't really kind of come into full force yet it's really it just launched there's no uh, churches that are officially a part of it yet, but it's coming. Um, and we realized that in the Dakotas, um, you know, that's going to make our conference smaller and their conference will be small. And, and what are ways that we can still share resources because we still know each other, we still hopefully love and respect each other. And so the idea for this standing committee would be to kind of negotiate what those things might look like. And that would include things like sharing our camping ministries. Our foundation has already gone to being the Methodist foundation for the Dakotas and Minnesota, meaning they would serve both United Methodist churches and global Methodist churches. Our United Methodist women are in fact no longer United Methodist women. They are women in faith, uh, which again is was done to be able to serve both United Methodist churches and global Methodist churches. And so uh, one of the changes that was made to that legislation is that it's not going to be solely just between the UMC and the global Methodist church, the GMC. So if I say GMC, I'm not talking about my car. I'm talking about this new denomination. Um, but also recognizing that out of this a uh, time of turbulence and splintering, there might be other expressions of Methodism that show up and, and allowing for room for their voices at the table too for negotiating. And so um, that I think was the one amendment that did uh, pass along with that piece of legislation. So at this point, it, uh, it's not been, not that that committee hasn't been filled with names yet, it was just created. But also at this point, we're not quite ready because even the global Methodist Church, which technically has launched, doesn't it's not peopled yet, um, and and the other expressions that may or may not exist, uh, that's still to be determined. Uh, it's it's more of a kind of again that planning and prepping for how can we work together, um, because you know, again we all know each other. We, we're from a small conference, not small geographically, but population wise we are. Any other? comments on that piece of legislation 
whole thing on that is recognizing that we're still part of the same family mm -hmm. and you need to work together. Yep. <clears throat> the next piece of legislation that we voted on, and, and you might be thinking like, you might have thought after their initial comments, like, oh, annual conference sounds fun. And then this is what we get to do is think through all of this really fun legislation, but <coughs> it's important. The next one is the lay equalization formula. So uh, I talked earlier about kind of our lay delegates. There is a formula in place for how to determine uh, what churches will, will provide the extra lay equalization delegates, where they're gonna come from. Uh, right now, it, it is primarily just based on what's the number of lay, equal de delegate, lay equalization delegates that we need, and then it just goes by the largest churches by membership and down until you have enough lay delegates. Um, one of the things that we've noticed is that there are churches that in the last, I don't know how many years, uh, were choosing to withhold their apportionments. Uh, for a variety of reasons that not happy with something, not wanting money to go a certain way or for a certain thing. Um, but they were still getting to send multiple delegates to annual conference and vote on things, even though they weren't contributing um, to, to our shared ministry together. And so this piece of legislation was basically saying uh, only churches that have contributed at least 50% of their apportionments in the last year or the average of 50% of their apportionments over the last five years um, are eligible to have additional lay delegates. So if your church has chosen to not pay their apportionments, they're not gonna get extra lay delegates, uh, that extra voice and that extra vote. Um, that's basically what this uh, piece of legislation is about. There was some, I remember some kind of like, well, why not just have it be 100% or working toward 100% because there is language in here, this, understanding that there are some churches that financially maybe couldn't make that commitment, but they're trying, they're working toward it, they have a plan. In that case, those churches would also be included. Missional churches, um, those are churches that are not fully incorporated, uh, are also exempt from that as they would have uh, been from the original uh, formula. So that's what that piece is, that passed. A to play. Yeah. Well, it's you you either be committed to to what we're doing together um, or you don't get a voice. Yeah. My father used to say, if you don't vote, you don't get to complain. Um, <laughs> and, and my father was a wise man. So uh, that's what that piece of legislation was. Legislative item one four uh, was modifications to the disaffiliation plan. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So we've kind of reference that a little bit and I want to um, <clears throat> talk a little bit more about it. So um, 2019 was a special general conference uh, that was uh, on the topic of LGBTQ, um, you know, kind of the fact that we're split over that, over the ordination and allowing gay marriage in our churches. At that time, what got passed was the traditional plan, which uh, we are still as a church, hear me, we are still as a church right now not affirming um, that that openly practicing homosexuals cannot be commissioned or ordained uh, according to our Book of Discipline, and United Methodist churches are not allowed to host same-sex marriages, nor are our clergy allowed to perform them. Um, but what happened after 2019 is that the divisions in the church just got deeper, and, and uh, it was a very close vote. And so uh, the, the traditional group decided, um, you know, they don't want to keep fighting this fight. And so they had been working toward creating a new denomination, which is where the Global Methodist Church has come from. Uh, also within that 2019 General Conference was a paragraph that was approved for a process of disaffiliation. Um, and so that process, it, the idea is it's to help churches leave the United Methodist Church, you know, over a matter of conscience on this topic um, a little more easily than they would otherwise. Uh, you know, typically we don't want it to be easy for churches to leave and become something else. We want our United Methodist churches to be United Methodist. Um, but we understand that we're just not going to agree on this. And so um, 
Dickinson was the first church in our conference to to kind of try to work that process. There were a lot of issues with how that happened. Um, and I think it was a very steep learning curve for our conference. Um, and so the conference kind of put together and outlined the, the entire process of what needs to happen for disaffiliation. It, it is um, a very detailed step-by-step -step involved process because it is a very big decision. Um, it, it, and it ultimately culminates and it needs to be a two thirds vote of all the membership of the church. Um, and I say membership, I mean, you have to be a member. And part of the process is doing a membership audit. Part of the process is, you know, listening and, and oh, I mean, just it's all kinds of things. Uh, and so we got copies of what that process now looks like, kind of with learnings from what happened in Dickinson. But there was one piece of that that the conference committee on finance and administration needed us to vote on that they wanted to change and that is about what the churches would need to pay for apportionment so part of leaving the church um every church contributes to the pensions for for the pastors that they've had in the church and so um part of what they have to pay is like remaining pension um, agreements um but you also have to pay your apportionments um and as I said before, there were churches now for a while that have been unhappy. And the, one of the ways they chose to express that was by not paying apportionments. Well, in order for them to leave, uh, the amendment stated that one, the local church shall pay any unpaid apportionments for the 12 months prior to disaffiliation. So they need to pay as they're going through that for that, that year prior, if they hadn't been paying apportionments, they need to pay all of that. They must be current on apportionments beginning January 1st, 2020 through the date of di disaffiliation, um, which would occur the, include the 12 months, so I don't know why. So if a, if a church hadn't paid their apportionments since January 1st, 2020, or any portion of that, they would need to basically pay that. That would be due. Um, if they had paid all of their apportionments, then you're good there. But then the local church must pay an additional 12 months of apportionments at a rate of 20% of their 2022 apportionment figures. And so uh, to leave, they would also need to pay um, 12 months of apportionments for this year at, at a rate of 20%. And again, that is helping to offset uh, the cost of them leaving, you know, of the cost of us doing ministry, as well as helping with any remnant groups. Um, that was what was um, uh, up for vote, just that piece. Um, and that passed. The big part, they also just opened up the whole disaffiliation process for discussion. It wasn't up for vote. This is what it is. Um, and the piece that I remember getting a lot of discussion is currently, right now, churches do not actually own their own property all of the property of the United Methodist Church, even though you as the individuals here have paid, uh, actually is held in trust with the conference. Um, and so uh, let's say this church or any church wants to leave, um, in order for them to take the building, to take the land, to take the assets, um, normally in the Dickinson process, they, they had to pay a percentage of that to, to gain the titles and the rights to all of that, because it's not actually the individual churches. Again, we are a connectional church. This property is meant to be used in service of the United Methodist Church. Um, one of the pieces to kind of help streamline the process for allowing churches to leave is that uh, they only have to pay $1 uh, for the transfer um, of the property. And that's any property that, um, except for, uh, like a memorial or something that comes in that is specifically designated to the United Methodist Church or the ministries of the United Methodist Church, legally that would have to then remain with the UMC because that would have been the donor's wishes. Um, but everything else would go with the church that is disaffiliating. Um, so they're not having to pay for their property, but they are having to pay their apportionment obligations to leave. Um, 
and that was there was some discussion around that some felt that the dollar was not enough and that that felt uh too too lenient um others who uh were probably more in ready to leave felt like the apportionment thing was not fair and i think probably if everyone is unhappy then it's you're probably making a good uh compromise <laughs> so <laughs> that's kind of where i came out at the end of that discussion was nobody likes this this is probably about where we need to be um in, in these kind of things but yeah there are some churches that have begun some of this process um and, and many that aren't. One of the things is this paragraph for disaffiliation actually has an expiration date uh, <clears throat> December 31st, 2023. And so churches that want to leave with this process have to complete that by December 3rd, 31st, 2023. So the end of next year. Um, and part of that is because there will be a general conference in 2024. Um, and, and that that general conference will then lay out a path that would supersede anything that we would do at the conference level, right? Right, because only the general, like this disaffiliation uh, process falls under a decision made at a general conference. Okay. Yep. Um, one of the things that Craig had mentioned earlier is about the voting of delegates. And so just as, um, a local church elects delegates to annual conference. It's at the annual conference level that we elect delegates to things like jurisdictional conference, which I haven't mentioned, but will be happening this year. Jurisdictional conference is like an in-between between our annual conference and the general conference. And that's where we elect bishops. And hopefully we'll get to elect a bishop to serve the Dakotas and maybe Minnesota, maybe, I don't know. Um, that'll happen this fall. Um, but at the annual conference level is where we elect our delegates to those things. The big question that's up in the air right now that we don't know the answer to is in 2024, when we finally have general conference again, which it better happen at this point, <laughs> just better, um, is, is it going to be the postponed 2020 general conference or is it going to be the 2024 general conference because we have general conference every four years and so are we just going to skip over 2020 or is this going to be that one or is it going to be its own so if it's the postponed 2020 general conference we already elected our delegates for that um, and so those would be our delegates to go to general conference if it is the 2024 general conference we have not elected our delegates for that and we would do that at annual conference next year what throws a wrench a little bit in our our annual conference is that our two of our lay delegates since being elected as lay delegates for general conference for 2020 have gone into the process for becoming clergy which god bless them we need it uh, but as soon as they begin to serve as clergy they're no longer eligible to be lay delegates and so we do know that next year at our annual conference one of the votes will be for at least the lay delegates will be voting on new lay delegates to general conference regardless of which conference it is I cannot vote for lay delegates. I get to vote for the clergy delegate um, and they cannot vote for the clergy delegate. They only vote for the lay delegate. Um, if that's something that you really want to do, then you would need to be our lay delegate, which you can do by the way, because you uh, the way that we're gonna move to selecting our lay delegates is the same process as for our leadership team. So you would just need to apply and then uh, we have three spots available. One of those spots will need to commit to being on the leadership team for a year as the uh, annual conference lay delegate. Um, but we're gonna do that every year because one of the things people keep asking is how do these people get selected? Um, and we wanna make sure that it's open to anybody who is a member of this church. You have to be a member of Yankton First United Methodist to be, a lay delegate from our church. Um, so that is that is the main criteria. You can apply for that starting now because one we will need to vote on those delegates at our charge conference this fall. 
Um, and right now I can tell you that you will vote on budget because we always vote on budget and you will vote on at least some lay delegates for general conference. The rest of the votes we don't know until April. And if you don't do it, then I'll take these three again because uh, I had such a wonderful time with the three of you this year. Um, what else did we need to talk about? There was one thing that was a little disconcerting was they recognize a lot of um, retirements uh, in the clergy and um, I think I jotted down that there were at this uh, annual conference there were 28 pastors eligible for retirement now a lot of them kind of keep involved and, and help out but 28 people are retiring and there were they also recognize people that are going into the seminary and people that are electing to go into the clergy and there were a lot less than 28 that were on that path and it brought home the the concern that that going into the future our clergy are sort of dwindling compared to the number of people coming in you know at the beginning of their careers and so we just need to do everything we can to continue to encourage people that uh, have felt the calling to facilitate that so that they can uh, be our clergy in the future yeah it's it's well, part of my role in the conference, I serve on the Board of Ordain Ministry, and actually my role changed at annual conference. Um, our our uh, chair of the Board of Ordain Ministry uh, resigned, and I am now the new vice chair, uh, so that's really fun. But I love what I do because the work that we do is uh, really supporting and bringing up the people that are coming into ministry. And, and it's an important job because as Dan was saying, there are less and less, we have churches right now that are still open. And what we mean by that is that they don't, we don't have a pastor to put there. And the conference has been doing a lot of really creative solutions to try to make sure that every United Methodist in the conference is being served in some way, but it includes um, lay people that are kind of coming in and learning how to preach and lead and and having churches share pastors and and using technology and kind of streaming in sermons and services from other churches uh you know they're trying really hard to be creative but it, it's a challenge we have a lot of rural areas we have a lot of churches that are quite small and maybe can't financially afford to support a full-time pastor um, but yet still have needs and still have value and worth. And, um, and so, you know, I think that's a big thing that we all need to be doing. And this church has, has quite a storied history of raising up leaders. Some of the, as Dan said, some of the leaders of our conference right now are from this church. Rebecca Trebs graduated from Yankton. Sarah McManus is also serving on the board of ordained ministry with me. Um, you know, Dane Zacherson, he didn't come up in this church, but he was here. Like he's, there's just a lot of people have connections with Yanks. And I think that's a big piece that we need to keep doing. For me personally, I would say the highlight of conference for me was Friday night is when we do our ordination service, when we um, kind of consecrate and bless our new pastors. And it's always very special for me. Um, but part of that service is is basically an altar call uh which we don't do a lot of in the methodist church anymore but it's a time where if people are feeling that stirring into ministry that they can come down and pray and and kind of begin that process and, and we can support them and and i get to be one of the people that prays if anyone who comes down it's it's my joy uh and the thing i look forward to the most and this year um a student that i had known in a previous church uh, came down to pray with me that he had felt God's calling uh, into ministry and and it was such a privilege to be in that moment with him and to share that um, and so I think that's an important thing that we need to keep lifting up and to remember um, there there are not enough pastors for the churches that we have um, 
there just there just aren't um, and that's not i think a thing that's without all of us working together to encourage to raise up to to invest in the discipleship of our people um, that's not going to get better uh, unless we work together to foster that environment where people can feel empowered to serve it just seems like it's a better time to be inclusive than exclusive <laughs> uh, uh, one other uh, that you that you did i know there are a lot of people from this church that have served but it made me think too we didn't mention valerie valerie uh, valerie hummel Pont lapontes you know? yeah, yeah yeah valerie and uh justin iverson and, justin and jen iverson. Yeah, there, jen kish whole, anderson oh, yeah sure left out others too, yeah but. well there was that just that one um <laughs> jolene Jolene Petrock, who's serving in my hometown. Yeah, that's right. I was her clergy mentor. If you want to, I mean, like we have so many, so many church. Yes, thank you for. Uh, one of the things I didn't mention was the miracle offering. We want to say yes. thank you uh, to all of those who gave to that. Uh, we we gave over a thousand dollars. I know from our church uh, toward the miracle offering. We collected. Uh, Craig, do you have that number in front of you? Well, they announced at conference 47,000, but it's still open. And I looked on the website, but I couldn't find any update. But. Yeah, so as of conference, uh, raised 47,000 to go to, um, so I'm going to let you read it since you have it in front of you. <laughs> Wings of Wellness. Yeah, and it goes to um, Todd County School District. It's basically to work with the Native American youth and suicide prevention is part of it and it's todd county school district in south dakota and in north dakota um <clears throat> the spirit lake ministry yeah, they're pretty, yeah. north dakota is the a school affiliated with spirit lake ministry and in todd county the tree of life ministry is kind of affiliated with this project well, well. and if you <clears throat> look on tree of the tree of life ministry if you look in our conference booklet at the board of Tree of Life, you might recognize the name of the president of the Board of Tree of Life, uh, Tom Gilmore. Um, and so there's another Gainton connection there. Uh, if you want to know more about that ministry, I, I wrote out with Tom last year for one of their board meetings and, and got to tour, uh, tour Tree of Life. I hadn't been there. I'd been up to Spirit Lake a couple times, but um, it's amazing the work that they're doing there and and i think this is a really good use of our funds to help meet some of the most vulnerable in our midst and so i'm grateful for it any other final thoughts about annual conference so the big thing we i think you we need to hear is right now uh there were no churches that disaffiliated this year um uh there are processes in place for churches who do discern that. Um, and, and there's a lot that are remaining United Methodists and, and looking to the future of, of what we're going to do together as a church. And so um, I will be hosting again in July another pastor chat, conversation with Pastor Katie. That's open to whatever topic, but if you want to talk more about annual conference or things happening on the conference or, or global level of the church, I'd be happy to visit with you uh, at that time. Or if you want to schedule a time with me, I'm always, always happy to visit with all of you. Uh, for some reason, people like to start off conversations. But I, I know that I'm bothering you. You're not. You're not. Uh, quite literally, my job is to be uh, of service to you. And so please know that I love getting to visit with you. Um, you're never a bother. Uh, it is it is my joy. Uh, so thank you. Um, and thank you to these gentlemen for not only going to annual conference, but coming today and sitting and, and chatting more about it. Uh, your service is greatly, greatly appreciated. So thank you so much. All right. Well, I think this is probably more than you ever wanted to know about our time there. Uh, so we'll end this episode now and we'll hopefully see you in worship very soon. God bless. Thank you for joining us. 
on this episode of What's Going On, a video and audio podcast of First United Methodist Church in Yankton, South Dakota. We'd love to have you join us for worship on Sundays, and we have two options available. 9 a.m. is our contemporary service, and 10.30 a.m. is our traditional service. You can find those online as well at our website, www.firstumcyankton.org, or on YouTube. 